Everybody, it's Michael the Silvis at Cold Green Church of Christ. Yeah, just kidding. New Hunter Church of Christ in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Uh, had a funeral today for a person that passed away. Jarvis's grandmother passed away at Mechanicsville. And so everybody was there. And I wish I could have been there, but uh, I didn't really know her directly, so that's probably why they didn't invite me. But I do go to a lot of you, y'all's sermons. I haven't forgot about you. But, um, you know, we'll pray for her family, and my condolences and thoughts go out to you during this time. And uh, sorry that's happened to you. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day as we embark on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, chapter 19 tonight, that we learn something and draw closer and have more understanding and meaning of you. And that we can understand that we have hope and trust and know that you will come for us one day to get us and call us up to be in the clouds, to be to go home to your Shekinah glory, to be in your bosom there on the mountain of the Holy Holies, to be in your awe and presence, as it says in the, fr in the throne room scene over and over again, as promised to us in a future tense, that past, in a future tense like it's already happened, but it hasn't yet, but it will, because it's a reminder of all the other things that have happened in the Bible that have come to pass. Thank you, Lord, for everything you do, and please be with me, the speaker, the reader. Help my voice to hold out. Help us be able to get this through in two parts, and Jesus may permit. And like I said, my thoughts and condolences go out to Jarvis's grandmother. And uh, um, also, we're going to read here lesson number 34. It's lesson 35 here in the thing, because it's a misnumbering, but it's really lesson 34. Uh, dealing with chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's get to it. Let's go right into it tonight. Chapter 19 opens up with telling us about the enemies of the Christians that have refused to repent to come to the Lord. Remember we talked about that? It says the whole purpose of God's retribution or punishment was to try to bring the Roman Empire to repentance. But they just refused to leave their idolatrous and lavish lifestyles behind. Instead, they just... History also tells us and records that the Roman Empire was one of the most decadent societies ever to inhabit a place on this earth. It says homosexuality ran rabbit, fornication and adultery and idolatry were the earmarks or call marks of their society during their time, just like it is in our time today. It says, and to cap all and to top all this off, they were also worshiping any manifested man made God that was false that was a false God that was imaginable, including the men on earth who were be, to be worshipped as gods, as an effort to foster public approval for the emperors says the Roman Empire forced the public to worship and bow down to them as gods on earth. says the nations making up the empire were eager for this money and supported you know, Rome's effort and gladly went along with it in the spiritual fornication of this, adult, of this idolatry. Now, from this, uh, from this viewpoint of the book, or not from the book, but of Romans, of the city of Romans and the citizens of Romans, this seemed like quite a tidy little arrangement that was made there. And it was successful for a great number of years. However, the fly in the ointment for them was that the... Christians refused to have anything to do with worshiping their emperors, and for good reason for doing so. It says the Christians served a the Christians, unlike the pagan gods that the adulter idolatrous served. Uh, the Christians served a real jealous God, uh, God who demands that He is the only one object or subject of worship. You know. And he was offended by idolatry. It is our God that he compares it to fornication, spiritual fornication. It says Christians are regarded by inspiration as the very bride of Jesus Christ. It says, and 
adulterous Christian is no different in the very eyes of God than an unfaithful spouse to his husband or to her wife or to her, you know, to his, to her husband or to his wife is what I meant to say. Uh, and this is well known to all Christians today. It says, therefore, worshiping a false god is absolutely forbidden and carries along with it the very consequences of spiritual separation from God, which is recorded in the Bible as being called, cited as the second death, spiritual death. It says, the Christian is expected to die if necessary to keep from bowing down and worshiping an, an adulterous or idol and the letter of Revelation, and in Revelation, it makes this crystal clear to everyone, even today, who does this. Is also, of course, of course, referring to the Roman Empire, too, uh, cared little or nothing about this. Because they just did whatever they pleased in the sight of God, regardless of the consequences that were endured, see? Because they just kept continuing to get fatty on all that lavish lifestyle and things, see. But see, to them, the God of the Christians was really nothing more than just mere silly superstition or or just, you know, you know, just folklore, you know. Like a lot of people in secular classes today in college will say, you know, they teach Christianity versus, you know, it's atheism. They, they, you know, atheists will just say God is a God of whoever you want to be or you know, like if you believe like what Oba believes in the crystals, which is another form of false god, uh, they believe that you can be a god yourself, which is totally a contradiction to God's word and to the Bible and to God, you know, the real true living God. So just to give you some, there's just a lot of that going on now, a lot of abomination. I says, after all, they were well um, practiced in inventing their own gods. You know, it's just like, why would they even think of the God, the true living God that Christians, you know, was any different than, you know, their man-made gods? It says they invented and pushed down the people's throats every day. It says all they knew was that the majority of the Roman citizenry went along with it. You know, they were partakers, in other words. And the Christians who were by far the minority during this time refused at all to at all cost to even go along with it at all, which is for good reason. It's a good reason not to. Uh, Christianity was outlawed during this time. It was considered treason against the against the empire if one ref, refused to even bow down to the emperor. It says <clears throat> the ability to buy or sell food. To work or to even live within the empire was made next to impossible for anyone refusing to worship the emperor. Unfortunately, says for the empire, says the malignant, invisible god of Christians was a lot different from their false gods you know, than all the many pagan gods they worshipped and served. It says the God of Christians was the one true and living real God. There was a living God that was out of all that was not that was out of all them. It says none of the gods of the Romans existed. It says they were just fragments or figments of their imagination. It says often at times were contrived for the purpose of controlling the population or, you know, bleeding the money out of them to, so they wouldn't have any money to buy anything or to do anything else except give to the empress. And which is totally, yeah, it's totally sin. It's atrocity. It's wrong. All right, so the God of the Christians, so the God of the Christians does exist and he is absolutely holy, just, and loving. And true and real. It says all powerful justice just to name just a few of his attributes. It says he gave mankind free will starting in with the Garden of Eden. And not once has he ever 
took it away, that privilege. It says he gave the Roman Empire and all of its citizens every chance to, you know, every church chance in the world to bow down and ask forgiveness and repent of all the time suffering the persecution and death of his faithful children. It says one can only imagine the wrath of a father who for the very sake of his religious nature watch the very suffering of his children in order to maintain all mankind's free will and give every lost soul the chance to repent and then to come back to the true living God. You know, that's how our God is, and that's how he is. Now, in chapter 18, this is where we saw the this point being pointed, that was pointed out, at which God has declared by saying, enough is enough. He stopped his foot down. He said, enough is enough now. Rome, ha Rome has not fallen yet, but it is so sure to fall that its destruction is mentioned in the past tense here. Meaning it hasn't happened, but it will happen. But the actual dest destruction of the Roman Empire begins later on in chapter 19, when we will see the Battle of Armageddon fought being fought it says but before we see the final destruction of the city of rome we will see a picture of the champion of god which is depicted as jesus christ you know and of all the christians as he prepares for this judgment that's going to befall on the roman empire and then later on on the whole world look at revel let's turn to revelation 19 verse 1 you got your Bibles, please turn to there, or phones or tablets. Just put them on vibrate if you have them. Uh, that way you don't have no noises going on except me talking. And uh, if you have it on vibrate, just put it on your on your hip, you know, and if you have a front pocket. Or, you know, don't put it on the back of your pew so it don't sound like something's drilling, you know, uh, um, because it takes away from the lesson. And, uh, you know, because I know if you have some people in the hospital, some people do, uh, please, uh, I understand that. But don't put it on the pew, okay? Just kind of keep it off. And if you don't need to have it on vibrate, then just turn it all off. All right? Just use it for Bible purposes. Don't be texting children or anything. Okay? On this time. It's disrespectful. Let's go to Revelation 19, verse 1. It says, If these things I heard, as it were a great voice of a great multitude, meaning in number in heaven, saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory, power belong to our God. Now, this multitude and vision here is the collective souls of those we saw, remember, who were beneath the altar, the altar of incense that's recorded in Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. It says, who were asking God how long it would be before their blood was then avenged by his justice. You know, that was against those oppressors who slain them and did whatever they did to them. That were mentioned again later on in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. And then worshiping God on his throne is what we see there in, that, in chapter 7, verse 9. All right, Revelation 19, verse 2. For true and righteousness are his judgments, for he has judged the great harlot, and we've, talk, we've talked about her for the last two chapters now, and her that corrupted the earth with all her fornication, spiritual, and um, but mostly spiritual, and then also some physical too, says he has avenged the very blood of his servants at her very hand. All right? I mean, all the people that were following after Christ, you know, some of them fell away because of all this stuff. Now, once again, we see the very judgment of the empire being spoken of in the past tense. There is judgment. Their judgment has been ongoing for quite some time now. And it's pictured in the bowls of wrath that were, that were mentioned earlier, you know, like in chapter 6. But the final judgment was yet to come. It says the final judgment would be 
would be seen as the empire's very destruction from the earth for all time, being moved away. Let's read Revelation chapter 19, verse 3. It says, And a second time they say, Hallelujah, and their smoke goes up forever and ever. And what do you think that means? Well, the saved death in Christ are now rejoicing that God's righteousness judgment has finally come. So as the imagery leading up to this supports that these rejoicings are really the very souls of the ones who were slain, meaning who overcame to the end. I mean, they were faithful to the end. They did exactly what they were told, and they didn't worship you know, those false gods, Cornelius or any other man-made emperors either. They were faithful and remained to the true God, living God. And they died for it too. And it's like we will if it's necessary. It says they were steadfast till their very death. And now their murderers are going to get their just rewards. They're going to be judged, just like was promised. Those who died for Jesus Christ have every right to expect the judgment of their oppressors to be fulfilled. And they will be fulfilled one day. You know, even in our day. It says they have been, they gave their very lives so that their enemies could have a chance to repent and also be saved. But, of course, we know they refused. Most of them did. So they loved their enemies to their own graves. I mean, even though they were being killed, they still, they didn't hate them, you know, because they knew they were working for a higher cause. That's how we have to look at it. Turn the other cheek. That's it right there, one-on-one. Um, but for those who refused to even repent, they got what they had coming to them, or they, like I say today, they got what they deserved, and they did too, and they will, even in our time, they will too, uh, like they did in Roman, and in uh, Babylon, and in the Persian Empire, and Aztecs, and all these civilizations that have collapsed before ours, and if we don't wise up, we're going to collapse just like they did, and all the world one day is going to collapse too, just because of that same reason. Now, we are starting to see now the picture of the final judgment that is yet to come it says all the enemies of the Christians died physical deaths. To be sure, but that is not that is not the very end of their very suffering by any means. Okay, It was only just the beginning. In the account of the rich man and Lazarus, remember that story that's told in the, in the Gospels? Uh, we have learned there that the rich man went straight to a place that was called Tartarus, which is in the Hadeum Rim, which we call Hades. You know, that's where people go that fall away, and people let go who just don't believe in God when they die. All right. Which is the abode, or you might call, might be called the abode of the dead. Now, Tartarus is also a place that is of torment. For the lost, and for, you know, that means those who have fallen away and those who just don't believe. I mean, if you don't believe or you've fallen away, you're still lost according to Jesus, and you're lost according to God. So, and they were all then cast into this lake of eternal fire. And that does not mean purification. Some people will teach this crazy notion that people will go to the lake of fire and then one day God will allow them to come out and they'll twist scripture and say, well, God does not want people to go to jail, to go to hell. I said jail, but I'm in hell. He don't want people going to jail either if they do the right thing. But the thing is, he don't want people going to hell, no. But it's not that he's going to take them out of hell once they go there. You see, he gives everybody opportunities to repent, and that's where they have the chance to come out of there. Now, people that teach his stuff that, you know, they're going to come out of hell one time, you know, after a while, after judgment is absurd because the Bible doesn't teach it that way. It doesn't support that. People go to hell, that's where they end up and where their final destination is. If you believe that you go out of paradise and you go to um, heaven, that's your final destination. If you're faithful, that's the thing. If you're not, well, then that's where you end up is in hell. All right? Now, and of course, in this place, it was darkness and there was brimstone in there. You know, there's fire, darkness, and brimstone. It says, the rich man cried out to Abraham that he would, who was being tormented, in flames of fire. And it says, And then when the enemies of all the Christians died, they went to the same place where the rich man went, and now are all suffering in the same very fire that he is suffering in. 
So truly, it can be said that their smoke goes up forever and ever. And it really does. So if you go to Hades, you're going to be in fire before you go to hell. Okay, because Hades is hell, but it's also it's also in a it's also in a you know when you go to when you go there it's the place before you go to hell so there's fire there too, all right. So the word smoke goes up forever and ever, are reminiscent of the very fate of those who worship the beast in Revelation chapter fourteen verses nine through eleven. Now look at Revelation nineteen verse four says, the four and twenty-four elders of the four living creatures all fell down prostate, meaning directly, all at the same time, and worship God that sits on the throne, saying, Amen, meaning let it be so, hallelujah, you know, incitement, that has finally happened. The vision here now switches back to the very beginning of the throne scene, which we saw in Revelation chapter 4, and we see... Here, the very same 24 elders and the same living creatures that sat around the same throne where Jesus sat on. It says this serves to tie both series of visions in this letter of Revelation to a common event. They're all connected together, basically. Now keep here in mind that the visions that John is, is reaccounting for us here are the very contents of the little book that was given to him in Revelation chapter 10. And we now see here, and in the following elements and events of this very vision, that the things which tie everything together into really one grand vision with one grand purpose or central theme. All right, Revelation 19 verse 5 says, And a voice came forth from the throne, saying, Give praise to our Lord, all you, his servants, you that fear him, the small and both the great. Now it says to try and to assign this voice that is coming from the throne is to a particular source is fought with frustration to some people and it is difficulties to some, to others. But in fact, that it comes from really the throne indicates that it is a directive from God. Okay, it is easier to think of this as a single voice of authority that is coming from the throne of God instead of a bunch of voices because that's what it is. It's really God speaking in a collective voice, but it's just really His voice in this case instance. So is this directive? From the throne of God is applicable to those on the earth in particular. It's pertaining to the ones who are saved and who died in, for Christ and in Christ are being represented in the next verse here, making the picture totally complete. Look at Revelation 19, verse 6. It says, Then I heard as if there were a voice of a great number of multitude." And as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunders, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord, Lord our God, God Almighty, mighty, rain, 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 rain. That's pretty, pretty much what it did, you know. There's a lot more voices than that, but just again, a little idea, a real representation there. And there we have a picture of the whole religious creation that is all praising God, all the way from the Garden of Eden to the end of time, uh, you know, in a perpetual, in a per perpetually way in, in cadence of rhythm. You know, all together in sync in unison here. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let's read that together. Let us now rejoice and be exceedingly glad, and let us give the glory unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife or bride has made herself ready. Now, the ones who are redeemed have every reason to be glad and also to rejoice here, and even to rejoice now. It says, if not for the very sacrifice that was made on our behalf, 
our fate would be eternally destruction, totally destruction, and eternally destruction. It says, for that we should all be grateful, giving all the glory and thanks to God, who had no obligation whatsoever to save us at all. He didn't have to save us, but he chose to because he loves us. That's it. That's simple. It says the saved here are being pictured as what? The very bride of Jesus Christ. The, cha the chosen ones, the chaste, the pure, and the holy. Christians, the believers. It says the relationship between Christ and the saved is comparable to the relationship between a husband and a wife. It says this is certainly a picture seen elsewhere also in Scripture, and there is not a better contemporary on this than what is being written here in Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23. And it says, it's, worth, it's also worth mentioning here that the bride of Christ has made herself ready. This means that all the redeemed have taken the necessary steps and done all the things that they were necessary in order to prepare themselves for this very relationship. Says the words of Peter, of Peter also speak succinctly to this very fact. It says this, Seeing you have purified your very souls in your obedience to the very truth. That's First Peter chapter one verse twenty two. It says the redeemed prepare themselves as brides by being obedient to the word of God in the truth that's found in the word. Revelation nineteen verse eight says this, and it was given to her that she should array herself in fine linens, bright and pure, for the linen is the righteous acts of all the saints. Now the words of John in 1 John chapter 3, verse 7, come immediately to mind when reading this verse. Little children, says this, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. The bride of Christ Jesus adores herself, and fine linen. And John then goes on to even explain to us exactly what that fine linen really is. And he says this, It is the righteous acts of all saints, of all the saints, meaning you and I too. We're all part of that pride. Okay? It says, Those who act righteously adore themselves in fine white linens, all right, which is the same thing as righteousness. And that's what it always is in Revelation when it's talking about that. And the bride enduring, that's what it's talking about. Revelation 19, verse 9. says, And he said unto me, Right blessed are they that are bidden, meaning chosen, to the marriage supper, meaning they were invited to the marriage, the feast of the Lamb, and be, and he said unto me, These are true words that come from God. Now, this is none other than really the Beatitudes that are found in the letter of Revelation. Let's look at them here together. And they are, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the very words of this prophecy, and keep all those things which are written therein. It says, For the time is now at hand. Revelation 1, verse 3. Start off with that. Blessed are the dead which died in the name of the Lord from hence, from meaning from Genesis on to now. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, their very labors, and their works do follow them. That's Revelation. That's talking about the righteous works, not the worldly works. All right, that's Revelation 14, verse 13. Now, three. Blessed is that who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his very shame. That's in Revelation 16, verse 15. 
4. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus, that's Jesus always. 19 verse 9. 5. Blessed and holy is that have part in the first resurrection. On such the second death have no power, but they will be priests of God and of Jesus Christ, and will reign with him a thousand years. That's Revelation 20, verse 6. Now, we don't know what that means there. I'm not going to say it means like what, what the millennials believe, or like what my friend Charlie believes, because they don't know if that's true or not. Because we don't know what it actually means there. Um, they believe that a thousand years, what we teach has already happened from Jesus' time to now, and has already come to pass. So that time, when we come under the New Testament covenant, that's part of that thousand year reign, that's happened, has already happened when the New Testament church started. That's tied in with that. Um, now look, 6 says, Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this very book. It's Revelation 22, verse 7. 7. Blessed are they that do follow his commandments, that they may have the right to the very tree of life and may enter in through the very gates into the holy city of heaven. Revelation 22, verse 14. That's what it's talking about there. Now, it is quite obvious from a reading of these very seven Beatitudes that those who are bidden, meaning chosen, to this marriage supper of the Lamb are only blessed if they, all right, listen, one, Heed and keep the commandments that are written within this letter of Revelation. Die in Christ, okay, that means be baptized. Keep their garments clean, meaning ask for forgiveness all the time. You know, every day, pray for it daily, that's what I mean. You pray for it daily when you eat and go to bed and when you get up. Participate in the first resurrection. That's always, can only mean nothing but baptism. If you're not baptized and you didn't participate. All right, keep God's commandments. See, it says it twice. All right, so you must die in Christ, which means you died when you went under the water. That was the first death, okay? And then when you rose again, that was the first resurrection. That's baptism. You can't do that until what? You're after, until after you're baptized, okay? So the fifth one is keep the commandments. All right, Jesus also taught us that many are called. He said this too. But only few are chosen. That's found in Matthew 22, verse 14. It says, All people are called by the very gospel of Christ. But in comparison of all who are being called, only a few will be, will be bidden or chosen to the marriage supper of the Lamb of God. It says, Only a few will become the very bride of Jesus Christ. Only those who adore themselves in righteous acts of obedience to do the very will of God will be bidden or chosen. I keep saying it because I want you because that's what it really means there. Religious acts are being represented as fine linens in verse eight in this chapter, like what we just read. Look at Revelation nineteen, verse ten. And I then fell down before his very feet to worship him, and he said to me, See thou, do this not, meaning stop, because I am not a fellow servant with thee. And he's saying, I'm a servant with thee, but I'm not Jesus or God here. I'm, you know, I, this is really an angel here speaking, okay? And he says, you know, uh, brethren, that hold the very testimony of Jesus, worship God, okay? For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, that's what the whole book of the Bible is. It's really a big book of prophecy. And so if we follow that and apply it and share with others, then we're doing just that. And that's what it's saying there. As encouragement to us as it was in the first century church believers. When this book letter was written of Revelation, it was saying that like it to them as it is to us. Now, there is some discussion about who... This is, and who told John not to worship him? Now, this individual is a servant with John and his brethren. 
All right, but G, but Jesus is mentioned in the third person here. All right, so if this person were actually Jesus, he would have said my testimony, okay, instead of testimony of Jesus, which means somebody else was telling the story here to John, okay? So this can only be an angel here who is speaking to him in this very vision. It's not Jesus here. So if you say Jesus there, you got it wrong. Because in this vision, that's not Jesus speaking. That's an angel speaking on his behalf. Okay? So, and this is constant with the rest of these visions that we are seeing. Angels were doing most of the speaking and communicating here with John during the writing of the book of Revelation. Not Jesus. Okay? Now listen. Revelation 19 verse 11. And I saw the heavens open up. And behold, a white horse, and he, and there sat there on it, who was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war with those who are unrighteous. I'll add that, because that's what ends up, that's what does happen and what will happen. That's what happened to Rome, so that's what will happen to us and anybody else who doesn't follow the will of God. All right. Now, why does the color always as purity, as we know? And, and also a horse is figurative here, language for war. And also can mean holy, too. Says for riding out to battle. Says now notice the words and make war at the end of this verse. In John 5, verse 27, that's the Gospel of John, we see that God, the Father, has already given Jesus the authority to execute judgment here. All right, now the war that Jesus makes is being described later on in this vision. It is a war that is against the beast and all the false prophets, you mean the gods, that are identified in chapter 13 in Revelation as the Roman Empire, personified in the emperors, as well as the religious cult known as Concilia, who was then reinf was reinforced as which, who invertedly reinforced the worship of the empress. Now that's that's what really happened. That's what led to their downfall. All right, the time for the judgment of Rome is now at hand. Says the champion Jesus. Remember, that's always Jesus right there. Of the Christians is mounting. His war, or mounting on his war horse, is about to carry out God's ju uh, righteous judgment on all the enemies of the Christians who were slain. Following a vision of Jesus Christ, which only those who were familiar with the scriptures would definitely be able and immediately understand and be able to identify the following the characteristics of the Son of God is easy for someone who is familiar with Scripture to be able to, to understand that. But if you didn't, you'd be totally lost. Look at Revelation 19, verse 12. It says, And his eyes are like flames of fire, and upon his very head are many diadems, and he has a name that is written which no one really knows but himself. All right, now if we look in the book of Daniel, we go to Daniel's vision of the pre-incarnated form of Jesus Christ. This is where we see these familiar words. His body also was like the berry, all right, or like the burial. It's B-A-R-B-E-R-Y-L, so it's burial, all right? We don't know what that means, really, truthfully. I don't. I'm a scholar. I don't know. Uh, but there's many different things we, we come to. Let's read here. It says, And his face at the very appearance was like the, like the brightness of lightning, and his eyes were like the lamps or flames of fire, and his arms and his feet were like collier or like a polished brass, and his voice was like the voice of words of the voice of a multitude. Now this is recorded in Daniel 10 verse 6. And we see again in Revelation chapter 1, verses 14 through 15. We previously have seen these words. His head and his heirs, 
meaning people that came before him, were white like wool, as white as pure snow, and his eyes were as flames of fire, and his feet were unto fine brass, and as if it were burned into a furnace like kiln, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So, you know, we see a similarity there between those two references, Daniel 10 and Revelation. We see those there being, you know, showing us, you know, very symmetry there. All right. Now, the name that no man knows is the very name of God. Now, if we look at tetragrammation, we see Yahweh is, is and, but, 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 but then we also see that it is unpronounceable. You know, man has been given the uh, pronunciation, and they came up with the pronunciation as Jehovah to this, but no one really knows for absolutely sure what this, if this is exactly correct or not. All right, but the pronunciation of Jehovah is really the best educated guess, you know, by most scholars. Anyway, inspiration through inspiration, John writes his name as being unknown, all right? The status of Christ as God in the New Testament makes it altogether reasonable and logical here that his name is Yahweh, or Y-H-W-A, which we pronounce Yahweh. However, it is pronounced in our language, we're not really sure. All right, two things that we can that of, of significance comes to mind here. First of all, we must recognize the unity and allness of the Godhead. Jesus, as the Word of God, shares the name of the Father. Okay, and it can be reasonably referred to uh, referred that. The three persons of the Godhead share in the same name, as they do. And it goes like this. We have God the Father as the head, or the Godhead. And then we have God the Son, who is the Word. And then finally, we have God the Holy Spirit, you know, as an intercessor. It says all three share in the same name of the Trinity, or Godhead. They're all the same God, in other words. So God has purposefully been amunetic here when it comes to the very topic of his name when it rises, choosing language such as I am or Yahweh or Y-H-W-H, which really pronounces Yahweh. God's name really is most holy name. It's worldly mankind, though, has a tendency to profane, you know, with profanity, the name of God, to the very ability that they can with their vocabulary. It says, all kinds of slanderous, profane superlatives have been, you know, contrived and applied to God. Though the enemies, says, it is little wonder that our most holy and creator God would not want for his very name to be associated with such things like this cavular. says, we have been given enough of him to know that he truly does exist in every way and form, as we mentioned earlier. says, we do not need to know exactly what his name essentially is in order to follow and understand him. says, someday... When all the saved come into his very presence, his true name will that will surely be re, then revealed to us. Until then, we serve the God, the great I Am, and the God Almighty. Now notice here, and the language that the angels are excluded here, also from knowing the true name of God as well. Now read it again. Now notice in this language too, that the angels that had also been with God in heaven, you know, they've been there. They have been excluded from knowing the true name of God as well. So this is going to be a surprise to both us and the angels, too, when God reveals it in front of them. Revelation 19, verse 13. Let's jump there. And he is arrayed in garments that are sprinkled with the very blood 
and his name is called the Word of God. Three, two, one. Okay, let's stop now. Let's stop now because we gotta gotta stop.